All right, notice with me as we come to the book of Hebrews. I'm going to read from uh, verse 14 through verse 18 this morning. And I want to title the message, Christ the Priest. He's our High Priest. And I also want to spend just a little bit of time on the subject of Melchizedek. Now last week we closed in the book of Hebrews and the book of Revelation speaking on Christ the prophet. Notice as we begin, our text is going to be verse 17, but I want to begin in verse 14. He says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and high, and a faithful high priest, and things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Father, we do thank you this morning for this privilege and this opportunity to assemble together and worship and to sing the songs of Zion, to look into your word, pray together, and fellowship together. Lord, we pray your blessings and your anointing to be upon the reading of Holy Scripture, for it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen, and you may be seated. Now, we have some other sermons, as I've mentioned to you, the offices of Jesus Christ, and we have some other sermons in the uh, in the series of the book of Hebrews about nine years ago on this subject, the book of Hebrews, we're going to see in a few moments, is that the whole theme of the book of Hebrews is the high priest, uh, Jesus Christ being our high priest. Now, notice with me as we come back and read in verse 17. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is presented to us in the New Testament as our great high priest, which was promised in the Old Testament, as we said last week about uh, Christ being a prophet that was promised from the Old Testament. Now notice he says here in verse 17, he said, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and high priest, in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. So we see here one of his threefold offices in the New Testament. He is our high priest. Again, we find this in the New Testament. It was promised in the Old Testament. Christ, as our mediator, performed all three of these offices. Next week we'll be talking about him as the king. And he performed all three of these offices in his earthly ministry and also in heaven today. Now, all three of these offices are necessary to confirm the new covenant. We'll make that very clear as we get toward the end of the sermon. These three offices pointed to Jesus Christ and his work, and they are covenant offices. One writer put it this way in reference to Christ, says, So glorious, one writer said, The calendar has changed, and instead of it dating from the beginning of the world, it was redated from the birth of Christ. This is how important that Jesus Christ is in the the New Testament. This letter was written... Uh, probably by the Apostle Paul, is written to believers in the first century. And as we closed out last week in Hebrews 1, verses uh, we read many verses in the chapter, but verse, especially verses 1, 2, and 3, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, and Revelation 1, 5, we find that Christ is the last and final word to the New Testament church. Now, please notice with me, 
as we back up. And notice with me this time in verse 9. Notice we see the necessity of Christ as priest, not only to make intercession for us, but to uh, suffer and die on the cross for us. Notice in verse 9, I'm just going to kind of cut into the text. We stopped in verse 5 last week here in this text. In verse 9, he said, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, and crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Now notice with me as we come back to verse 14 again. I want to come back to verse 14. He says here in our text, He says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He also, referring to Christ, He also Himself likewise took part of the same. In other words, He took upon human flesh. Here's the reason. That, that through death He might destroy Him that hath the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them, that includes you and I, deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Verse 16, For bear, verily, He took not on Him the nature of angels, but He took on Him the seed of Abraham. Now notice in verse 17 again as we come to this. Now Jesus Christ is our high priest. The book of Hebrews here in chapter 2 introduces us to him as the high priest. As a matter of fact, he's called our priest, our high priest, in chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10. So you may not have to leave the book of Hebrews this morning because we're going to go and read each one of those. And there's something uh, a little bit unique with each one of these passages. But right here in verse 17, we're introduced to Jesus Christ as our merciful and faithful high priest. Again, this is the theme of the entire book of Hebrews. It is the most distinct title in the entire book. And we find, as we read Revelation chapter 1, beginning somewhere around verse 10, we see the glorified Savior in His priestly garb, in other words, in heaven. And so when we talk about an high priest, we find that a high priest was one who was holy. As we go back to the Old Testament, especially in Exodus chapter 28. It was someone who was holy. They were set apart unto God. They are also a mediator in religious things. In other words, we find that they represented the people of God before God. And in Exodus chapter 28, just to give you an example, and again, we're going to stay here, but we find that the high priest was marked by holiness. Even his garments was holy. They were set apart unto God. We see the high priest was marked by holiness and judgment and truth and reconciliation. That's exactly what we see here. We see that Christ came as our high priest to reconcile us unto God and to forgive us of our sins, to die for our sins. And we find that as we consider the Old Testament, uh, we find that in Exodus 28... Verses 2-4, through four, you see the uh, again the garments of the high priest. God took great care in putting His garments together. You'll find that in verses 9-12, through 12, there were two onyx stones and that were on His shoulders. And on each of these stones was six tribes of the children of Israel. In other words, the high priest bore the burden of the children of Israel as he went uh, into the tabernacle before a holy and righteous God. We also find there was a breastplate. Not only did he bear the burden of his people, but there's also a breastplate that had 12 stones, 12 different stones with the names of each one of the tribes of Israel. 
In other words, the breastplate is showing that that the, the people were close to the heart of the high priest. Now think about Jesus as we talk about the high priest of the Old Testament. And so He bears our burdens, and we are dear unto His heart. And so all of those things was a picture and a figure. They were real to the children of Israel, but they're a picture and a figure of the coming of Jesus Christ. And Aaron bore the names. He was the first high priest, and he bore the names of the children of Israel, and again, on his shoulders and also on the breastplate. Now, notice with me, let me read in verse 17 again, and then we're going to just, I'm just going to carry you through the chapters I mentioned and make comments on this. I believe this will be a blessing to you. In verse 17 again, and then this, again, this whole chapter is dealing with Jesus Christ going to the cross, being the Savior of the world to die for the, for our sins. But in verse 17, he said, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that is, he took upon human flesh, that he might be a merciful and high priest in things pertaining to God. Now notice the latter statement here. And to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. In other words, he came to make an atonement make reconciliation to bring forgiveness of sins for uh, His people. And so we see the importance here of the high priest, not only of the Old Testament, but Jesus Christ being our high priest. Now notice when in chapter 3, he begins with a verse with the word wherefore, connecting us to chapter 2. But notice in chapter 3, reading in verse 1, I'm going to read the other uh, the whole six verses in just a moment to begin this chapter. But in verse 1, he said, Wherefore, holy brethren, speaking to the Christian, he said, Partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So he's not only in chapter 2, our merciful and faithful high priest. But we find here in this passage that he is the apostle and high priest of our profession. Now, when we come to this, again, this is connected closely with chapter 2. We, could, we are to consider the apostle and high priest of our profession. In other words, let us think about this and meditate upon this and ponder on this. Notice he's our apostle. He is the sent one. We talked about him as a prophet last Sunday. And he was as Moses. He was sent by God, as in Deuteronomy 18 in Acts chapter 3. What is an apostle? An an apostle speaks to us from God. What is a priest? A priest speaks for us to God. And so we see Him not only as our apostle, as our prophet, but we see Jesus Christ as our high priest. And here we find, He says in verse 1 again, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. So we find here that uh, we see our profession in Jesus Christ, our confession of Jesus Christ. In other words, this speaks of our confidence and our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ. It shows the importance that Christ is to you and I. But he also speaks of the church in this chapter. Now, throughout the book of Hebrews, Christ is compared with the angels. He's compared with Moses. He's compared with other things doesn't mean the angels are bad or Moses is bad, but he's just showing the superiority of Christ in everything because he was God in flesh. Now notice as we read from verse 2 through verse 6, and he says here in this passage, and as we read this, keep in mind that Moses was faithful to God. He was highly esteemed among the children of Israel. And uh, we find that, uh, but here in our text, the Holy Ghost shows the superiority of Christ because we find Moses is faithful over his house, 
which was the church in the wilderness, the nation of Israel. We also find that he, uh, that Christ is superior and that he's faithful over his house, which is the New Testament church, but he also built all things. Notice in verse 2, who was faithful to him that appointed him. He was appointed by God. He said, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. He said, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath built the house hath more honor than the house. Notice in verse 3, for every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses barely was faithful in all his house. Again, that's the Old Testament church. It's called a church in Acts chapter 7. It's called the nation of Israel as well. And he says that he was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of the, those things which were to be spoken of. Verse 6, but Christ as the Son over his house, this is the New Testament church, whose house are we if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of our of the hope rather firm unto the end. So we see here the importance of Moses in the Old Testament as we saw last week, but we see one who is superior to Moses who built all things, who created all things, and he is over his house which is the church of Jesus Christ. Turn with me please to chapter 4 and notice with me in verse 14. Here's the next time that we see this uh, high priest. I'm reading verses 14 through verse 16. Now notice carefully as we come here. He says in verse 14, 15, and 16, He says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but it was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now this is a tremendous passage. And we find here that he is our great high priest in verse 4. Now, we've already seen him connected in chapter 2. He's connected with our reconciliation, our forgiveness of sins, our salvation, our atonement. We also see him connected in chapter 3 with the church, which we are a part of. But we find here that he has a connection, in other words, with grace. That's already been mentioned twice here this morning in testimony. But he mentions grace and he brings comfort to our hearts. Now notice back in verse 14. He says here in verse 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest, notice that is passed into the heavens. He's seated right now at the right hand of God. He said, Jesus, the Son of God, He said, let us hold our profession, that is, our faith. He's a great high priest because he has passed into the heavens. We're going to see a little comparison between the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood of Christ after the order of Melchizedek here in a few moments. But the priest, the Levitical priesthood, was not bad, but through the animal sacrifices, nobody could be saved. And that priesthood constantly died out over each generation. And we're going to see that as we read on. But notice here, we find that He is our great high priest. He has passed into the heavens. And He said in the latter part of verse 4, Let us hold our profession. In other words, we find that the word great here means dignity, majesty, excellency. We find that He's passed into the heavens as we've seen last week in chapter 1 and verse 3 and verse 13. In other words, He's our representative in heaven before God. We also find that on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would carry blood into the tabernacle or the temple 
once a year on the Day of Atonement uh, to have the sins of Israel atoned for, their sins forgiven for another year. Christ went into heaven after He shed His blood. The priests, all of the priesthood, the Levites and so forth, um, cultivated in the high priest as mediator between God and man. In other words, that whole priest was centered around the high priest, again, that, that uh, uh, mediated between God and man. We find that Aaron became the first high priest of the Old Testament of the tribe of Levi. That one tribe was set aside for the priesthood. That was Moses' uh, brother, uh, his descendants. Now, notice with me as we come to verse 15. He said, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. So as we come to verse 15, we find that he was tempted in all points as we're tempted, but we find that he was without sin. We, we find that he was tempted as we are. He's sympathetic to our temptations. We all go through temptations. We've prayed about those this morning. We talk about them. And we're all tempted to sin and to give up the faith. We're all tempted to compromise. But we find that Jesus Christ is sympathetic toward each and every one of us here this morning. And notice also in verse 16, He said, Let us therefore come boldly. That means with confidence. Let us come boldly under the throne of grace. And this would be like coming before His mercy seat. And He said, Let us come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. That has to do with pardon. That we might find grace, that has to do with favor. That we might find grace in, in time of need. We have the privilege today to come boldly. To come with confidence anytime we desire before the throne of God. And we also have mercy and we have grace And we can come before Him, according to our text, in time of need. In other words, we can get divine strength as we come before the Lord in prayer, in worship, in distress, when we've got problems, we've got needs, we've got concerns, things are going not the way that we think they should go, and we all deal with these kind of things. But we can always go before the throne of grace and pour our hearts out before God. And He's promised that He will listen to us. He's promised that He'll be attentive to us. And you read about that in Ephesians 3, verse 16 through 20. And also in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 13. Now notice as we come to chapter 5... Notice as we come to chapter 5. Now we're going to see here again as we read from verse 5. I'm going to back up and read. Well, let me just go ahead and read the first four verses before I get into this particular text. Because there's a comparison here between the Levitical priesthood and Christ. Notice verse 1. For every high priest, talking about the Old Testament taken from among men is ordained for men and the things pertaining to God, that he may offer both uh, gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Even the high priest was born in sin, as all human beings are, So that high priest of the Old Testament could have some comfort as he went and represented the children of Israel before God because he's one of them. But notice in verse uh, 3, he said, And by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. So when the high priest of the Old Testament went into the tabernacle once a year to put blood up on the mercy seat, he's doing this not only for the people, but he's doing it for himself. 
because he needs forgiveness of sins. And then, notice with me in verse 4, And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Again, Aaron was the first high priest in the Old Testament. There was many after that. Now, notice with me as we come from verses 5 through verse 10. I'm just picking out verses in each chapter. You can go back this week if you got the time and read all the chapters and put everything together. But I want you to see the importance of Christ being our high priest. Notice as we read from verse 5, we are going to have something new incorporated in this chapter and also in chapter 6 and chapter 7. He said in verse 5, So also Christ glorified, glorified rather not Himself to be made in high priest, but He that said unto Him, Thou art My Son, today I have begotten Thee. In other words, Christ was appointed by the Father to be the high priest here in the New Testament. He goes on to say, and here's the new thing that we see in the book of Hebrews that's given to us. Verse 6, And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever. Notice that word forever. The Levitical priesthood, they died out throughout the generations and had to have new priests. But he said here, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now we're going to see this again in chapter 6 and chapter 7. Notice as we read on, speaking of Christ, who in the days of His flesh, when He had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto Him that was able to save Him from death and was heard in that He feared, though He were a son, yet learned He obedience by the things which He suffered, and being made perfect, that is, in resurrection, he became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey Him, that is, them that believe. Now notice verse 10, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Turn with me to chapter 6 and notice here. In chapter 6, reading in verse 19 and 20. He says here in chapter 6, 19 and 20, speaking of Jesus Christ, He said, "...which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which after entereth into that within the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered," that is, Christ entering into heaven. He goes on to say, "...even Jesus made in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we have these, this verse here speaking of it. Now chapter 7 verse 1 begins with the Melchizedek of the Old Testament. But I want to jump, we're going to come back to verse 1, but I want to come down to verse 17. Notice as we come to verse 17. Now keep in mind, as we read in chapter 5, Christ is after the order of Melchizedek. He is not after the order of the Levitical priesthood. He's after a new order, a higher order, in order that the new covenant, the final covenant, could be established. And so verses 1 through 4 in chapter 5 contains a general description of the Levitical priesthood. Now, notice with me, as we come to chapter 7, I'm going to read first of all verse 17. He said in verse 17, For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 19, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by which we draw nigh unto God. Come down with me to verse 21. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that saith unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now notice as we read on about Christ being after the order of Melchizedek. 
He says in verse 22, he said, By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better covenant, a better testament, I should say. And then, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered, that is allowed to continue by reason of death. All of them died eventually. He said, but this man, speaking of Christ, because he continue, continueth ever, in other words, he liveth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Again, this book is comparing Moses and Christ, the Levitical priesthood and the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, not saying the Old Testament was bad, it's just saying that Christ had to come to establish a New Testament so that all of humanity from Adam to now could be saved. So he goes on to say in verse 25, speaking of Christ, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us. So Christ sits in heaven today as our high priest, and he makes intercession for us at this present time. Notice in verse 26, For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests, that is the Old Testament, to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins, then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered himself, verse 28, for the law maketh men high priests which have infirmities, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son, that is Jesus Christ, who is consecrated forevermore. In other words, he's perfected in resurrection forevermore seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, go back with me to chapter, uh, in the same chapter, go back with me to verse 1. So he's our high priest that liveth forever. Now come with me and notice with me in verse 1. I want to read verses 1 through verse 5. Now this Melchizedek that we're talking about, this is a mystery character that we find in the Bible. He only appeared one time. He's mentioned three times. and Well, in three sections of history. But he only appeared one time. He was without any recorded genealogy. And he was not found on the registry of the Levitical priesthood. In other words, he, he was no descendant of Levi. And what is interesting is that when we read about Melchizedek, we see him 500 years with Abraham before the Mosaic Law, before the Levitical priesthood. So he's an interesting character. And if anybody ever tells you they know exactly who he is, you probably shouldn't listen to them. There's so many interpretations as to who he is. Some believe he's the incarnate Christ. Some believe that he was Shem. I mean, there's many different theories about this, and I don't have one. I just know that he existed. He was extremely important. If I gave you my opinion, he was literally a local king and priest in Abraham's day. That would be my opinion, but I don't know. Now, the reason that people get, get really far out with this is because some of the statements that are made here in this passage. Now, we're only going to read part of it. It actually goes from verse 1 through down verse 16. But let's read from uh, verses 1 uh, through 4. He said this, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, these are things that we do know, king of Salem, that is, later became Jerusalem, which means king of peace. He's a priest after the Most High God. He was the righteous one. He goes on to say, "...who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him." Abraham went to deliver his nephew Lot, 
and he fought the battles and won the battles and delivered them. And Melchizedek met him on the way coming back. He said in verse 2, To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. So Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. First being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. He goes on to say, Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of days, but made like unto, he was a type, made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So this is where it gets a little difficult, and there's why there's so many different interpretations uh, of this. And keep in mind, he would have been a Gentile priest, priest of the whole world, because there was no Jews until, you know, Abraham... And uh, and we find that in, in that Abraham bless, blesses him, um, and um, or honors him. Let me put it this way: Melchizedek blesses Abraham, and Abraham honors Melchizedek. So there's something great and majestic and unique of Melchizedek, because Jesus Christ is after the order of Melchizedek, not the Levitical priesthood that existed 500 years before Moses and Levitical priesthood. So a very, very interesting figure. And we go on to read in verse 4, Now consider how great this man was, talking about Melchizedek, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Now what is interesting is that we find his name, we find it in three different parts of the Bible. We find it in Genesis, first of all, in 14, verses 18 through 20. He appeared to Abraham as the priest of the Most High God. We find it again, and again, that's 500 years before the Mosaic Law, and that's about 2,000 years before Christ came. We find it the second time in Psalms 110, verse 4. We find it in prophecy there. Melchizedek's not there, but David prophesies of Jesus Christ being after the order of Melchizedek. Christ is predicted to be a priest by special appointment of God, as we've already read. And that's about a thousand years later from Genesis 14. It's a messianic psalm. The whole psalm is messianic. Psalms 110. Christ is the king, verse 1. He's the priest in verse 4. And we find that he's after the order of Melchizedek, which speaks of a brand new order and a brand new covenant and a final covenant that is established through Christ. Now, What I want to do, I told you I was going to leave you in Hebrews, and I'm going to keep my promise. But I'm going to come, and I'm going to read to you just quickly, in Genesis 14 and then Psalms 10. I'm going to read two verses out of Psalms 110. But in Genesis 14, just so you know where this is at, we're talking history now, and this is the only time that Melchizedek shows up in the Scripture. Now we find him mentioned again and again in Hebrews. In Hebrews, I didn't give this to you, in Hebrews is the third time in chapter 5, 6, and 7, and we find this all fulfilled in Christ, again, a thousand years later from Psalms 110. So from Hebrews 14 to Psalms, about a thousand years from Psalms, to Hebrews is about a thousand years. So listen to this in Genesis. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies 
into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. So this is the only place we literally find Melchizedek. And again, he very possibly could have been a local king and priest. But now listen to Psalms 110. I'm not going to read the whole psalm. We have uh, two or three sermons on the whole psalm. I'm just going to read two verses. I want to read verse 1 and verse 4. In, in verse 1, we find Jesus Christ as the King. And in verse 4, we find Him as the priest. Christ is the King priest. In verse 1... It said, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And he goes in verse 2, 3 and describes that. But now listen to verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not repent, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, coming back to the book of Hebrews. In coming back to the book of Hebrews, we're going to step out of chapter 7 into chapter 8, verse 1. Now, why is all of this important, even though we may not completely understand every little detail? <clears throat> Again, Christ priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek, not the Levitical priesthood. Now, I wrote something down on a card just so I could remember it because I've preached on this a number of times over the years in different sermons. But I want to tell you what's in Psalms 110. The psalm is divided into two stanzas. Verses 1 through 3 is Messiah as the great king. Talk about that next week. Verses 4 through 7 is Messiah as the great priest. The psalm is messianic and has been called by many the crown of all psalms. It is one of the most comprehensive prophecies of the person and office of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. It is the most quoted psalm in the New Testament. In reference to Jesus Christ, in addition to that, verse 1 is the most quoted verse of all the psalms in the New Testament. In verse 1, as I read just a moment ago, I need to go back there, because I want to make mention of something here. In verse uh, 1, this verse is quoted or alluded to about 25 times in the New Testament. Now that's a lot for one verse out of the Old Testament. And verse 4, now listen to this, we just read them, we didn't read it all, but verse 4 dominates three chapters in the book of Hebrews. It dominates chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7. So the things we don't understand, we can make it up with the things we do understand. Christ priesthood was after the order of Melchizedek that existed 500 years before Moses and the Levitical priesthood. And He ever liveth. And Abraham gave tithes to him. And he blessed Abraham. But listen to this about Psalms 110. Verse 1 says, now listen to this carefully as I read it, because it's quoted in the New Testament. The Lord said unto my Lord, think about this. This is a conversation between two persons in the Godhead. God the Father and God the Son. How do we know this? Jesus quotes this in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Especially Matthew 22. He quotes this saying, He's talking about me. 
So he says, the Lord said unto my Lord, this is God the Father speaking to Jesus. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand, which is where he's at today, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And he goes on and talks about his reign in verse 2 and 3. So there's this conversation between two and the Godhead, and Jesus quotes this, and Peter uses this text in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost to prove that Jesus Christ is at the right hand, and that He is Lord, and He is Christ. Now listen to this, verse 1 is directly quoted seven times in the New Testament and alluded to, as I said a while ago, many many more times. And we've already seen some of this in in Hebrews. So verse 4 of Psalms 110 is the center of the psalm and Jesus Christ is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. David is the author of the psalm. And he received this revelation from heaven of the coming Messiah who would be the king and priest. And that he would be a descendant of David and he would sit upon David's throne and he would establish the kingdom forever. And I testify to you this morning, he sits upon the throne and he established his kingdom in the first century, and that kingdom has existed in a spiritual form for the last 2,000 years. So now, let us come to chapter 8, and chapter 9, and chapter 10, and I'll let you go. All right, now notice as we come here to chapter 8 and verse 1. He says here in verse 1, He said, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. In other words, he's going to sum up everything in chapter 7 about Melchizedek and Christ being the order of Melchizedek. He said, we have such an high priest, here's this word again, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary into the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Again, if you were to read verses 3, 4, 5, and 6, he's he's making the comparison between the earthly and the heavenly. The earthly wasn't bad. What God had with Israel wasn't bad in the Old Testament. It's just that no one could be saved through that. Jesus had to die for Moses' sin. Moses would have never get into heaven. Jesus had to die for Adam and Eve's sin as well as theirs. We're going to read that in chapter 9. But now, let me close with these three chapters. Why is it important to have an everlasting priesthood? Well, it is the establishment of the new covenant. The final covenant. It's new. It's final. It's established by the blood of Christ. That's why Jesus, when He took the cup in Matthew 26, I believe it's verse 28, He said, drink of this. This is My blood in the New Testament for you. And so this, so He had to be a priest as well as a prophet and as well as the king to rule over His kingdom. Now notice as we come down to verse 6, reading from verse 6 to verse 13. Now, the book of Hebrews gives more attention to the new covenant than any other book in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, where we're going to be reading from now, it quotes the entire passage from Jeremiah 31, verse 31 through 34, here in Hebrews 6, verses, I'm going to say 6 through 13, and it, it's, it's the longest quote that we find in the New Testament from the Old Testament, and it's almost verbatim, but it's all about the New Covenant. Now watch this. He said in verse 6, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator 
Notice of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant, we call it the old covenant, but but the first covenant, he said, had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Well, who was faultless in this? The people. All you got to do is read Jeremiah 31 before the verses I just gave you. He said, you failed under this covenant. So I'm going to make a new one. And he said in verse 8, for finding fault with them, that is the people, he said, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. So we have the better covenant, the first covenant, the new covenant. And he said, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This is why the gospel went to them first. As you read through the New Testament, it goes to them first, then to the Gentiles. He said, not according, verse 9, to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them with a hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. So they broke his covenant, violated his covenant. He said, I'll make a new covenant and on better promises through the blood of Christ, not through the blood of animals. And notice now, beginning in verse 10. He said, For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. What you're going to find in the words we're going to read, you're going to find the new birth, regeneration, the atonement. You're going to find uh, the relationship that we have with God. Many things are given. He said this, He said, I will put my law in their mind and write them in their heart. That's the new birth. That's regeneration. And then he says, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. That's what he said to Abraham in Genesis 17. And then he said, and they shall not teach any man his neighbor, nor every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. All will know him. In other words, God will put his Spirit in our hearts, and we will know the Lord personally. And then he said this in verse 12. He said, I'll be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquity will I remember no more. It's part of the new covenant. That's why we can sit here this morning and rest in peace and comfort knowing that we are saved by the grace of God. Then he said this in verse 13, in that he said, a new covenant he hath made the first old. That's why we call it the old covenant. Now, that which decayeth and waxes old is, what's the next word? Ready to vanish away. Why why would he say that? Well, in God's mind and in the disciples' preaching, once that Christ died on the cross, on the day of Pentecost, they're preaching that salvation is only in the blood of Jesus Christ, but the tabernacle stood until A.D. 70, And the priests, the Levitical priests, were still given sacrifice, but God didn't recognize them anymore. So he finally had the temple torn down and had that destroyed. In other words, he took it out of the way because it was it was uh, useless after that Christ died on the cross. So it was ready when the book of Hebrews was written. It was before A.D. 70. So it was ready for this thing to completely be set aside. And to this day, they have not had a temple in Jerusalem to sacrifice animals. And many Christians are worried and hoping that there will be a temple built back there. Why, is my question. The Bible doesn't teach that there will be a temple built back. And if there is one built back, it will not be of God. It will be built by the Jews themselves and it will have nothing to do with God or Jesus Christ. Now, notice with me in chapter 9. We're just about through, I think. Notice with me in chapter 9. So the new covenant is new. It's final. It is established through the blood of Christ. He is the mediator of it. Now, notice as we read in chapter 9, verse 11... Through 15. But Christ being come in high priest, 
So I'm taking you through each one of these. Of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once. You see that high priest in the Old Testament had to go in every year, bring the blood, and there were daily sacrifices by the Jews. But he said he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For the blood of, of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the peering of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So the emphasis is upon Christ, His blood, the new covenant, salvation, and making that comparison. Now verse 15. He said, For this cause He is the mediator of the New Testament, and that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament. Notice it took the New Covenant, the New Testament, and Christ's death to cover all the sins of the old. Were those people saved? Yes. But they, they were still saved through what Christ has accomplished. When they were obedient to God and carried the animal sacrifice, God counted their faith as being true and obedient, but it took the blood of Christ to even save Adam and Eve and Moses and Abraham and Noah and all the other Old Testament saints. And then he finishes this verse and he says, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now this whole chapter is dealing with this. This chapter in verse 1, chapter 9, begins with the first covenant. And then he gets into what we see here as the New, Co- New Testament. Well, turn with me to chapter 10, and we will close in this chapter. Keep in mind that Jesus in chapter 12 too is the author and finisher of our faith. Keep in mind in chapter 13 and verse 20 is that uh, he, um, he speaks of the everlasting covenant. But notice now as we come to chapter 10, first of all reading verse 21. He says in verse 21, he said, And having an high priest, notice, over the house of God. The house of God is the church. It's the believer. Those throughout the world, no matter what country they're in, those who truly believe in Christ, they're part of His church. But let me back up. Before we close, let me back up. And I want to read from verse uh, 9. Notice with me as we read from verse uh, 9. He says here in verse 9, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and uh, offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. That's the Old Testament. Even as you get into New Testament times, even until A.D. 70 they were still doing this in Jerusalem. But notice verse 12, 13, and 14. He said, But this man, referring to Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, notice this, for, for, for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God. And from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Taken right out of Psalms 110 and verse 1. And then he said in verse 14, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. If that won't secure you in your salvation, I don't know of anything that will. 
sanctified in verse 10, sanctified in verse 14, perfected in verse 14. He's talking about our spiritual standing before God as a Christian. Then I want to just read just briefly. Notice in verse 22. And view of all this, verse 21 tells us that he's our high priest over his house, his church. So what are we to do? Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Let us draw near. Verse 23 says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And then in verse 24 and 25, let us consider one another to provoke and to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. After giving us all this truth, he said, let us draw near with a true heart. Let us hold tightly this profession that we have, this, this faith, and let us consider one another as we assemble together on a regular basis and worship together. Would you stand with me please? I pray that you've trusted this. you put your faith in Jesus Christ. There's no other way to be saved except through the blood that she, Jesus Christ shed at Calvary. The Gospel is clearly mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day. We're promised that if we'll repent of our sins and put our faith in Jesus Christ, that He'll save us. Romans 10, 13, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is all under the new covenant. Isn't it a wonderful thing to think about Christ not only being our prophet, He's our last word, He gives us the last word to the church, but He is our high priest. There's no need for any other intercessor. In other words, He intercedes for us at this present time. Of course, the Spirit is within us here on earth and intercedes for us as well as we go to the Lord in prayer. But He sits there beside the Father until one day His enemies will be under His footstool and He'll come back and redeem His church. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Somebody say Amen. Father, we thank You for this day. We thank You for Your love and kindness and mercy to us. Lord, we thank You for the privilege You've given us to assemble together. We ask Your blessings now upon the rest of the service. For in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.